Welcome to the Athena 40 podcast, Conversations with Women from the MENA region. This series is in partnership with NAMA Women Advancement Establishment, a United Arab Emirates-based organization founded on the vision of an equitable world for women. In this series, we are hosting exceptional women from the Middle East and North Africa. They are thought leaders, entrepreneurs and policy makers. And I am your host, Elizabeth Filippouli, founder of Athena 40, an international platform connecting women leaders. I'm delighted to welcome you, Russia, for what will be a conversation which I think will be inspirational, motivational, and so much to share, right? Well, it's my greatest joy to be here with you. During this podcast, the whole idea is to hear your story through your own words. And I would like us to go back to the little Russia, the young girl. Where did you grow up? Talk to us about yourself. Who is Russia? Oh my goodness. Do we all try and find that little person inside? Especially now during this time, we all go on that journey to try and find who we are. I think it's important that we all do discover that little person and nourish them. You know, discover them and look out for them. Um, so I discovered, I don't know if I necessarily discovered her yet, but I knew where I grew up and I grew up in London and it was in born and bred in London, the UK, and was born in St. Mary's Hospital. And I spent a lot of my summer years in the south of Spain, in Malaga. So a lot of those incredible smells and incredible food and the warmth and the, um, the kindness of the environment um, was very much part of my upbringing. Um, my parents, my father's from Syria, my mother's from Scotland. And so a lot of their um, warm nature also was a very much a part of my upbringing. And they were just so very much a part of um, the texture of my upbringing. And, you know, had this incredible, lovely, natured woman who raised me um an irish lady who raised me until i was 11 when i went to boarding school and she was just the loveliest loveliest lady took me from the day i was born in um, in st mary's and was effectively my second mother if that's even possible and loved and nurtured me my whole life her name was mary divine if you can imagine that name. Indeed, a very special name for uh, what sounds like an incredibly special woman who had a major role in your life uh, with two parallel cultures, um, through the Scottish culture on your mom's side and the Syrian Arab culture on your dad's side. How was that shaping you, forming the way you were thinking you were acting gosh what a fantastic question darling well you have i'm sure you've been to the north of england it's an incredible space and they're so deeply grounded and earthly as are everyone in the middle east they're so deeply earthed and so connected to their environment and you know for example my mother for christmas she'd always give us these incredible stockings and she'd put stockings from um, Marks and Spencers in them <laughs> and she'd put them in there and say you know these were and you know these would keep me warm throughout the winter months and stuff and so these were the stockings you know so whenever I pass m and I always think oh I'm going to go and get it my my stockings for Christmas so she's a deeply deeply grounded person and very practical and you know always made me think about my environment and you know she'd always walk down the street and if there, was, if there was somebody on the street she'd always say you know please give this to that person and don't forget to give this to that person I now do that with my children it makes me remind myself to give that to that person on the street and um, just because it's the right thing to do and you know this my mother did it with me and you do what you you do what you know and my father comes from a very you know it, it's probably more colorful background but rich in texture and but also deeply grounded and 
you'll go to the, say the marketplace and they'll want to give you so much of their they'll they'll want to give and help and love and support and that's very much my father's background and he's very much a helper and supporter and deeply empathic human being and you know so he'll want to support and love and nurture in any which way he possibly can um, as will my mother so they both very much came together and although they were from different cultures would you say that your parents or your mom was more like I don't know your mentor did you have a mentor I mean, mentors are such um, important figures in your life, aren't they? Um, my parents were fundamentally and absolutely my first ever mentors. Um, they, they were the blueprint for my life. And then as I grew and came into the world a bit more and you know, met incredible professors, for example, at college or role models in my life, such as yourself Elizabeth or some you know <laughs> you know suddenly you have incredible people that you can then incredible friends and that you say wow you know these are incredible people and you know you say wow maybe they will mentor me too and these are people that can that take time with you and help you and nourish you and support you as well and you also spend time with them supporting them and along their journey and you do it with exceptional love and you know you do it with so much support and you just want to give as much as yourself back so there's so many people I can think of I guess in in my orbit that I would I'm immensely grateful for and it's just a small I'd say a small cluster in my in the palm of my hand that I would really count on as immediate mentors but and the people that I would say are, I'd say definitely the blueprint are my parents. And if I, if I walk into a situation that I think is unknown to me, I go, what would my mother or my father do? That really is kind of the, if I've kind of exhausted all possibilities in terms of what my parents would do, I would then look to what someone I genuinely admire in my outer orbit or close proximity would do and I'd say wow what would they do I really admire them and you know they do it really well I really admire them they're really fantastic or maybe it's someone even from a novel or a poem or a song you know who's really inspired me and it just stays in here you know and I go oh wow what would they do I don't know but it's inspired me and I go oh, I'd love to be like that you know, and maybe that would be that person or, you know, there's like a muse that you think, oh, maybe she's like that. And I'd love to be that person. And I'd love to be that muse. And you just kind of aspire to be the very best you possibly can be. What you're saying and the way you have described it, described it is so beautiful. And I think it touches on Something that I, I always believed in, which is how can we learn from each other's stories? How can we learn from each other's lessons and wisdom and dreams and visions? And so thinking about, you know, what you just said, that you're thinking when you find yourself, I don't know, at a dead end or a situation which is more complicated and you're trying to find the solution. And I mean, let's face it, we do come across such situations all the time on a daily basis, be it for smaller or bigger, you know, decisions that we have to, to take. It is important to think of someone and how they would handle it. And so uh, that's the whole idea behind Athena Forty, as you know, to, to share stories as, as women and to be able to learn from each other. So uh, I'd like to take you to your, I don't know, late uh, 20s, perhaps, which is not that back, you know, <laughs> far back in reality. But uh, after your studies, what did you do? What were the first steps that you took, you know, to, to launch your career, to launch your dreams in a more formal, more systemic way? Gosh, well, after I graduated from college, I, it was really on the, on the backdrop of 
quite a difficult landscape, but no one, I mean, now we're in a pandemic, I really, you know, everything in hindsight pales in comparison, really, really. But at the time we we're going into a recession and as a student, again, but my nature is not to overthink things too much. In I, I hope a positive way, I don't over ruminate on too many points. You know, that's just my nature. So I'll, um, but we were going into a recession and it was getting, you know, the landscape was looking supposedly bleak. And I was invited to a, to a conference in Berlin. And I remember listening and walking into this kind of, this economic conference and thinking, gosh, there's so many entrepreneurs and they just don't know quite, they don't really have a North Star. And I went for supper that night and I had this kind of flash in the pan idea. I thought, oh, I will create an ecosystem where they can go to and they're gonna have everything at, the fi- at their fingertips. That's what I'm gonna do. And that's gonna be my lifetime, and li- that's gonna be my mission for life. That's what I really, 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 really care about. I want them to go somewhere safe and warm and nourishing where they can nourish their souls and, souls and their minds and they could learn everything that they can possibly learn about entrepreneurship in this one space. And I just have been doing it ever since. And I remember sitting at dinner thinking, this is what I want to do. This is my mission. This is my drive. And I love it. And I basically have been doing that ever since I left college and been trying to find the best possible iteration of it. And as with every company, it evolves with every iteration and with every landscape, you have to look at the landscape and say, well, what's the best possible iteration of the product? You look at it and you go, well, I have a product. How do I best evolve it in this landscape and that's what we've been doing since I graduated and I love it. (laughs) I think I skipped a question which I should have uh, raised. Talk to us about your studies. What did you read in the university and how did those studies influence your thinking? So I was on my way to doing pediatrics and I specialized in um, psychology and cognitive science. So that was my um, my speciality. And I'm looking at my, um, it's very, very bright, so forgive me, but I'm by my window and on my window shelf right here, I've got a whole stack of um, science books <laughs> that I like to read. One of which is, I'll take the first two. One is the psychology of the art reader. Oh, wow. And the next is the beginning of infinity. By David Deutsch. Mm. So, and I got a whole stack, and I put a whole stack by my window shelf, and I make sure I get through them every. You know, so that's the beginning of kind of the. I have a number of books like that, and I kind of go through my little books and anything that and I got maths books. I've got another book there which is about quantum physics. Another book which is about um, it's called From Bacteria to Back and Back by Daniel C. Dennant. And you just have a whole range of these wonderful books. And um, incidentally, I'm, um, there's a book club that I started with my children over COVID. So all the best ideas I you know, always get started around the kitchen table. <laughs> and um, they came up with this idea for us, which was the, the Bluebird Book Club, which was great. <laughs> and all the mamas are like, oh my gosh, we've got to have a Bluebird Book Club. And so we're all kind of book clubbing, which is wonderful. And so they walk around with their little bags and they, you know, so we get loads and loads and loads of books in, which is so much fun. And, um, and now my, my little stack on the window shelf is going up and up and up and up. <laughs> and uh, the boys have got their, their little bags and you know, anyway, they're having a lot of fun with that. And um, so how do my studies affect what I do? It's the passion of knowledge and that knowledge is power and that, I can give my child and my children, my boys and girls, I can hand them a book and know that I'm empowering them for the future. And I'm giving them the tools to empower themselves makes me so thankful. I mean, it's, you know, I can give them that book one day and say, this is yours, you know, that's theirs, that's their book. They're they're the global leaders of the future. And I want to help them on their next step. How can I best do that? And I'm just helping them do that, hopefully with this. So would you say that your mission 
is to pass on some knowledge, to, to help people, support people, be it children, like your kids, or be entrepreneurs with the value of knowledge. And is this what Tucan is about? Is this what Nest is about? Which are your projects? And of course, I would like us to know more about them from you know, your, your lips, your words. So yes, it's through the value of knowledge, you can empower yourself. And, you know, especially in this post-COVID world, it's extremely important that, so, I mean, I can literally hand them a book and I mean, empower themselves through the value of education. And I mean, for me, that is something that is invaluable. And just something that to be able to do that is something that is, you know, the most spectacular thing in the world and makes, you know, has driven me since I've left college. Is there anything uh, in particular that you read recently in one of the books that you have there that kind of, I don't know, stayed with you or inspired you or gave you a different perspective of things? In terms of my mentors? No, I'm referring to the books. The importance of reading, which I truly, you know, wholeheartedly share because I'm myself an avid reader. I was recently actually um, reading a, a tweet by Elif Shafak, uh, the Turkish British author, and she was saying just read anything that you can news, novels, um, history books, biographies anything that you get, you know, your, your eyes on, make sure you read it because the value of knowledge and wisdom that you're gaining is, is unique. And so I totally hear you when you're saying that, you know, you want to uh, read as much as you can and you want to communicate and pass on this knowledge. So that's why I'm asking if there is a book which you read recently and kind of stayed with you for some reason. I mean, so many books come to mind. I mean, literally, literally so many books. One book I'd say that has stayed with me for a long time and maybe was very, very fundamental in my upbringing. I'd say that I kind of, I remember going to the library and picking off the shelf was a book by Carl Rogers and it's called Becoming Human. And it really is about, you know, he's the father of all, you know, psychoanalysis. And he's someone that I remember the first day I went into college and I started learning, you know, I went in thinking I'm going to be, I want, I want, I'd love to be, you know, a doctor. I want to go and learn everything about the brain. I want to go and learn everything and be a surgeon. I, I really want to go and learn that. This is the book that kind of stopped me in my tracks. And made me think, you know what, maybe there's something else I want to do or learn about. And he was the father of all, you know, everyone talks about positive self-analysis and psychology this is where it started and he talks so rawly about being introspective and holding the mirror up and self-analysis and I remember reading it cover to cover so quickly thinking oh my gosh he's so I mean the way that he's able to analyze is so beautiful it gives me goosebumps just thinking I, I need to read it once a year at least just to make myself feel just to keep just to keep touching base and the way he views the world is really really special and I was really touched when I read that book and the way that you know when you when you hear someone who's who sees the world in such a special way and also he has he had such a deep impact on the field he even curated a whole new field you think it's really quite remarkable for someone to be such a pioneer in their day and age to read someone's mind you know someone's mindset that I would say was quite a remarkable book it's kind of like picking up the bible of psychoanalysis it's pretty remarkable psychoanalysis uh, which is a process and it's not an easy one because uh, we are making a choice and the choice is to start exploring some perhaps difficult and complicated parts of our lives, our childhood, 
but it can be a process that connects you to your real self, to your authenticity, and kind of also clear your vision for your future, who you want to be, why you want to be this one, this person, and not someone else. I would like us to, to talk a bit about that, because I think that many women, and we know, of course, the, about the imposter syndrome, about insecurities, about fears, about guilt. So a variety of negative feelings that, that women are hindered by. How can psychoanalysis help? I love that question. Um, I mean, psychoanalysis is, um, is a helpful support sometimes in being able to lend a vantage point or a mirror and self in a self-reflective, gentle, kind way, just to lead someone down the path of to help them blossom and grow with some gentle, gentle but firm probing questions. And they'll ask someone just to kind of almost like a if you see someone that comes into the office, they'll there's that almost closed up like a like a flower at, in the night. And they just you sometimes they just need to be opened up a little bit. And you know, you give them a dash of water here, a dash of water here, a dash of water here, a dash of water here. And every time you meet with the with your clinician, they add a dash of water. And those are the questions. And the questions is almost like the lifeblood. And it makes you feel that you're that you're blossoming a little bit more. If you choose to go down the route, you don't have to, of course you don't. You don't have to do any self-analysis at all. But it, if you choose to look in the mirror and say, well, what's helps you to you know it takes immense courage as well to have a look in the mirror and to do as you know if you want to even do a self a painted self portrait of yourself you need to have a you know tremendous courage to do that to look at yourself and say look and to acknowledge that we're all flawed none of us are right none of us are a complete picture and we're all on a journey uh, we're all looking to grow and but we're all on that journey which is wonderful and to, if we acknowledge that that we're all on a journey then that's fine but every time you meet with someone who's there and to help then you accept the help and hopefully you accept to blossom as well and you accept the questions as supportive rather than invasive um, some people see them as invasive and that's fine as well. But um, the analysis is there to offer um, some guidance and you have the power to say whether you choose to go down that road or that road. It's completely within your power. But the analysis is there to offer you some kind of self-reflection should you choose it to then offer you the opportunity to blossom and grow. Do you agree with... Um this idea that happiness can be found uh, within. It is a matter of attitude. It is a matter of, well, happiness perhaps is a very deep meaning. I would say joy. I would say, you know, um, positive thinking. It's something that we can cultivate, we can nurture. It can be a choice. I, I mean, I don't know that that's what I think, but my question was, what do you think? Do you agree that this is uh, an attitude towards life that is, is a matter of us to decide to go for? I, I agree with you. I do think that um, happiness is something that is, is very much within our souls. And I do love that um, philosophy, that it's very much in our hearts and you carry it around with you and you radiate it. And it's something that you would, but it also comes from your environment. Um, you know, it would come from your immediate environment, uh, but it comes, I would say, maybe from the environment within that you self cultivate and curate. So if you're maybe an unhappy person, you need to reflect on why you're not happy. But then some people probably don't recognize whether they're unhappy. Maybe they're happy in that state. Uh, maybe there's some people who are happy, 
you know, what does happiness really mean? <laughs> it's their constitution to be like that and their constitution to be a certain way. And some people, and, and there's people who are just drawn because they're beacons of light and people are drawn to those beacons of light because they're naturally, their constitution is to be naturally happy. But yes, you do carry it in your soul. You do carry happiness in here, but you do have to keep ensuring that your internal, I guess, um, environment is, has been remedied and I guess, well, nurtured, I guess. Do you agree that it is important to be surrounded by people who are positive? So, so uh, people who are being supportive, uh, who are being optimistic, encouraging, do you think that this also helps? So that's fascinating. Now, I'm a massive believer that like attracts like. So very much, you know, I'm looking at my physics books here. <laughs> You know, so if you're going to, and I roll up my sleeves at the, <laughs> at the thought of this, at the thought of physics, you know, magnets attracts magnets, like attracts like. That is, and in, and in nature, you know, like attracts like, you know, you'll have attractions and we can go into the world of attractions and I will be very happy to talk to you for hours about attractions. I find that very, very fascinating. But in terms of, there's also what I've been toying with philosophically also is the and I'd love your, your your input on this is the 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 fascinating world of of those that challenge you and I find that I'm immensely grateful to all of those that have challenged me over the years because I'm I grow immensely from that and you know to have to be surrounded by people that only su are supportive you don't necessarily see say the downside of your project so say you know, your project is, you know, if you have people just saying yes, 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 your project may not necessarily fulfill its full potential. If you have someone who is, and I'm not saying just a naysayer or a negative Nancy, but someone who is actively, oh, who is, who's pointing something out that you may not necessarily, that may be contentious to you, you may have to listen and it may not be necessarily what you might not want to hear. And they may be a strong force. You may go, okay, well, how do we remedy this? And this is someone that you may really, really admire. You may go, wow, I may have to, you know, we may have to fix this. How do we fix this? Because I really admire this person. This person has to come along with the journey with me. Um, how do we remedy this? So, or there are times when this person doesn't have to come on the journey with you. And that's okay. That's very natural as well. But a lot of the times, if you really admire them, they have to come on the journey with you. And you have to remedy this. You have to find a way to, to solve it. And, you know, sometimes you're not aligned and that's all right, but you have to find a way to find a solution, a diplomatic solution or a solution nonetheless. And, you know, I find a healthy challenge, a very, very stimulating thing for a concept and it helps the concept to grow. So personally, it's very, very good to be in a, I like personally to create a nourishing, wholesome environment for people to work at their very, very best. Then again, I'm also finding that having a healthy, creative environment in which to, to ensure that the concept works at its optimum ensures that the concept gets to its peak. I, I wanted to ask you now about, you know, what keeps you excited? What makes you excited every morning that you wake up and you really look forward to doing it? Well, first of all, it's conversations like this. Um, I love catching up with my dearest friends. It's been far too long. I can't wait to hug you properly. Um, second of all, it's the deep passion of knowledge. I adore knowledge. I live for knowledge. And I live to pass on that knowledge. It makes me so happy. That is my, that's what I live for every day. I'm surrounded by books. I'm surrounded by, I, I daren't show you my workstation part. You can probably see little bits of it here. <laughs> um, it is a little area that's filled with books. Um, and I want to pass that on every day. It makes me so happy. I'm passing that on to others go on to fulfill their ambitions and, and their dreams makes me burst with joy. And so currently your big, big, big project, is it the nest? 
So I've got two. Okay, fabulous. Tell us more. <laughs> so I have got two projects. I've got The Nest, which is um, our online education company, and The Foundation, which is which complements it as a foundational piece. The Nest is our, com- I guess, our commercial piece. And it's and if you're um, an entrepreneur and you want to I know, find out anything in the world about entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship and learn about entrepreneurs and be the very, very best entrepreneur you could possibly be and just learn from other very awesome, cool entrepreneurs and the nest is the application for you. And then you go there and you can download the app and, and you have the world at your fingertips. It's amazing. And then the foundation. Before we get to the foundation, yes, I would like us to focus a little bit more on the nest because there's so much to, to share about it. And what is the website? How can someone visit and learn more? So at the moment, we are quite, we're, we're just, we have an application and the website is, is joining soon, but it is a web, it's an application for now. Great. So someone is able to download the application and, and log in, is it, or is it still at the, a better stage? No, we're launched. We're in the application store and you can find us in the application store and we are there and that's where we're at. <laughs> Fabulous. So yeah, let's let's talk about the foundation. And then the foundation, what's wonderful about that is that you can then take all the knowledge that you've learned through NEST and bring it out into the real world. And you can come to the foundation, get a scholarship and even come to get a job. So it's taking all of that knowledge and we bring it into the real world and really apply it. So it's not just sitting there, you can actually bring it into the real world as well. So that was, that's what makes us so, so happy. Um, I guess a couple of final questions in, in this conversation, Russia. A message that you have for other women? Oh gosh, in what capacity? Well, that's, that's a very good question. Well, you are juggling a number of things. You are a mom of how many kids? Four. <laughs> so how can you manage, how do you manage to balance everything? Raising four kids, running a, an ambitious project, launching a foundation, uh, you sit on advisory boards. Uh, so, so you wear so many hats. And at the same time, you are trying to stay connected with Russia herself. So your inner needs. How do you experience that, which is something that I would like us to share with other women? I put the question out to you as well. I mean, it's the same for every woman. Trying, you know, no day, no day is the same at all, at all, at all. And I'm immensely thankful to a team that's around me that, you know, both at home and in the office, that I would never be able to do anything without them. Without them, you can't do anything. You know, it's, it's by having a fantastic team that you can do anything. And, you know, really, really, it's the, you know, it's my incredible peeps in the office and my incredible sisters that allow me just to kind of do what I do. Without my crew, I can't do anything. And, you know, I like to arrange really great get-togethers for them all and as much as I possibly can, just do events, you know, now it's not as easy because we're in COVID, but we do things on Zoom or at home, I'll do as much as I possibly can for the girls. And in the office, we do as much as I can. I just send them really cool links or just try and keep the community spirit up. I keep connected. I mean, like for me, it's through books. Honestly, I read a lot. I love, I love to exercise. I like to go out for a run and I make sure I do that every day if I can. Um, I love to go out for a run. Um, music is a great solace. I love to create wonderful long lists of music that kind of I can get lost in. You know, wonderful music, wonderful books, wonderful um, running. And, and you just find a way somehow, if you can, to balance and spin those plates with the people that you really, really care about. And if you do, just keep nurturing and respecting all those people around you. And it doesn't have to be a big orchestra, but just make sure you nourish and cherish each and every single one of them in your 
every single person in your ecosystem and you just respect every single person in that and our family's number one you know that's all I'd say you know, I'm with you. I think it is very important to surround oneself with uh, uh, people that we trust for the judgment. And uh, that is what, because we live very you know, complicated lives and we do, we have our hands on a number of demanding things. Perhaps, you know, sometimes women like you make everything seem easy, but it's not easy. It's, it's challenging, it's, it's difficult, it's time consuming, it's psychologically draining at times. But if you have around you a cluster of people whom you can trust and they will, their judgment is a good willed sound judgment that will take your dreams, your vision, your actions a few steps further, I think that is a blessing in life. Completely. That's very, very sound advice. And it's about having people that you know, mentors that you can go to that you trust and you know that, you know, you can, you can say, look, I have a problem. What do you think? Can you help me with this? Or I have an idea. Can I trust you with it? What do you think? And if any one of those orchestra members starts to, doesn't start to oscillate with you, then you start to think, are you a healthy challenge? Or is this challenge not worth it? And you have to think about it. And then you have to think, does this orchestra member have to leave the orchestra? Or is it, or is this just a matter of us figuring out our creative differences, which is very, very healthy and normal. And you want that, you want that, you want them to contribute to the overall piece because you want, because generally the, you know, that creative discussion is usually very healthy. But if it continues oscillating on a different frequency, you don't really, and it's not so healthy, then you have to think it's not worth the energy. But if it's if it's good, you want your whole the the overall output to be healthy and the sound to be good. Well, I think that we've had a great conversation, and I would like to really thank you for for the time. Thank you for listening to the Athena 40 podcast, Conversations with Women from the MENA region, brought to you in partnership with NAMA Women Advancement Establishment. If you want to get in touch with us, please email us on info at athena40.org. That is info at athena40.org. For NAMA's work, please visit www namawomen.ae Keep well, stay inspired and motivated. Mm-hmm.